ready? Good afternoon, everyone. I guess you enjoyed that movie. <laughs> I'm not the only one here feeling waves of nostalgia. I'm sure there are a few Brits out there, yes? <laughs> I'd like to introduce um, some of the voice talent and the technical crew from the film. Uh, we'll have them come and sit down, and then they can tell us who they all are. Welcome. Right, who's at the far end? Where's Rhonda? <laughs> All right, we'll start with the last one up. Uh, this is uh, Rhonda uh, Ayubi. Uh, she's the CEO of uh, RG8, Rubicon Group Holding, who co-produced the movie with DreamWorks. Um, to her left is Rob Sanders, the editor. To her right is Mike Disa, the, the director, and Nicole Dubuk, the screenwriter. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Dubuk, is that right? Dubuk. <laughs> uh, Peter Woodard, Woodward, uh, who is Edwin Carbuncle, one of the best named villains ever. <laughs> uh, Susan Dewardon is Sarah Clifton. And not the small boy you might be expecting, Sandra Tellers is Julian Clifton. Thank you, guys. Thank you for being here. As some of you might know, uh, Postman Pat, of course, is not terribly well known in America. So I'd just like to start by asking all of you what your experience of or knowledge of Postman Pat was prior to this production. Can we start with you, Rob? Uh, nothing. <laughs> As and then it was a really fast education on getting as much backlog material as you could look at and living with it for a good six months before we even really got started. And you might be surprised to hear, uh, Rhonda is actually Jordanian and Postman Patty is actually a huge TV superstar in the Middle East, which she will tell us now. <laughs> yeah, so I was very, very, very much aware of Postman Pat. All my kids grew up with Postman Pat. Uh, it's a very popular char character in the UK, might be outside the UK, Europe, Middle East, very much so. So we're aware of it. Okay. Was he new to you, Mike? Um, well, no, I knew of him, but that was just because I was a huge Red Dwarf fan. And ah. I know that doesn't quite connect, <laughs> but um, when I was growing up many years ago, we had this thing called Videotape Kids, which you might remember. <laughs> And we used to go around, if you, if you liked English TV shows, you had to go basically trade them with friends. And so as part of trying to get the Red Dwarf collection, I got, I got things like Postman Pat and Thomas the Tank Engine and stuff like that. And um, so yeah, I knew who he was because I'd stolen his um, intellectual property many years <laughs> earlier. Nicole? Well, I was a Pat newbie, so I did a ton of cramming on this project to learn everything I could about Pat. And that song, the number of times I caught myself singing that theme song just out of the blue, is like, oh, it's in my head. So at that point, I thought I had assimilated Postman Pat pretty well. Um, Peter, of course you know about Postman Pat. Yes, well, when I first moved to the United States, I wondered what was so different about this place and how certain things you know, were, were, were very strange to me. And, and of course, I realized it was the absence of Postman Pat in the United States <laughs> that you know, made the difference between Europe and... Yeah, I mean, I, I, I didn't quite grow up on it because I'm a little too old for that, but my son did. He's now 20, hi, and hi. still occasionally... Um, Peter. All right, I, I, he still occasionally can't, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, sings Postman Pat in the bath, so... <laughs> <laughs> he was actually in the... He, he ran away yeah, son was actually in the movie. <clears throat> I mean, well, his voice was in the movie. Yeah, my, oh, son, what, what my, was my son Charlie, was, uh, he played one of the, the, the young lads. It was his first professional job. Oh. <laughs> it, was, it was adorable. Yeah. Um, I, um, yes, I, I think I was about eight when it came out in the UK. Um, so I was a bit old for it, but I watched it. <laughs> I didn't have a younger brother or sister, but I watched it all the time. I can't pull up anymore. So. Oh, there. <laughs> um, uh, so, but I did. And yes, the theme song... Um, I would sing all the time. It was just Postman Pat. You just watched it all the time when you came home from school. 
And Sandra? Uh, no, I actually didn't know about Postman Pat um, very well. I had heard about it through kids um, of friends back in the UK. So when I got the call for it, I, I sort of knew, but then immediately I went in and I started watching everything and, and started singing the song just like everybody else. <laughs> Yeah. And now you can't get the song out of your head, right? Yeah, well, well, it's more the other song, actually, now that I can get out of my head. Yeah. yeah. So, Rhonda, I wonder if you would explain how this project came about for your company. It seems to be a prime time for vintage British TV characters. The Paddington Bear movie will be out here next month. We've had Thomas the Tank Engine. What, why is the time right for, for Postman Pat? And, you know, and what was the, the process of putting this together? It's actually a co-production with... DreamWorks, who are sort of something of a silent partner, but nonetheless a partner. And I'd just love to hear how it all came together. Um, as all good things uh, happen, uh, they happen very naturally. And then you look back and you go, wow, uh, I was brilliant in designing it. But actually, <laughs> it, it, the, the company does two things. Our company produces as co-producers with uh, studios on properties that is ic iconic property that is known uh, but needs refreshing so that's one one of the things we do the other is we do our own productions uh, in our uh, search of iconic properties that need refreshing and bringing into the 21st century uh, we met and spoke on multiple occasions uh, with, uh, uh, it wasn't DreamWorks, the owner of uh, Pat uh, was not DreamWorks at the time when we started to uh, speak with them. And this is one of the properties that uh, Classic Media uh, presented as something that Pat has never been done in a film. Uh, it's stop motion as people might or might not know on BBC for 30 years. Uh, and there's not much more that can be done with it in stop motion uh, if you don't put a story around a postman who delivers post on a, sing ever, on a daily basis. And actually in the BBC series, he often fails in delivering post. <laughs> so something needs to be done to, to get him... It's a social service job, though, he's fine. <laughs> <laughs> As, and he's extreme, hugely popular. Um, so we we figured it's a it's a good uh, icon, it's a good char character to try and bring into the twenty first century. Uh, create a movie around the character, and when you create a movie, it has to be more than delivering post and uh, more than a, a good guy, and that's it. Uh, and that's how it came about. A classic Media was bought by DreamWorks in the middle of a project. So we started with Classic Media, not DreamWorks, ended with DreamWorks. Uh, and I'd like to ask uh, Sam, Mike, and Nicole also. I know that the film did come with a script when you became involved, but a lot of changes were made. And I just you know, wonder if you can talk about you know, your intention for the film, anything that you did add to the script. I assume the real reality show element was there already. Um, I love that there's a very strong female presence in this, which I'm sure came from you, Nicole. I love the female director and camera lady, and well, that's just <laughs> fabulous. But, you know, if, I just wonder if you can just talk about your, you know, early discussions and planning. And obviously, you know, as, as you may or may not know, an, an editor in the animation process is um, so much more critical from the beginning of the film than in a, a live action film. You know, it's a very different process. So I wonder if, Rob, you might also address that also. <coughs> I wasn't sure if you were asking Nicole. Or, oh. um, editing in animation to me is um, far more rewarding than live action, though I do love to edit live action as well. It has its own unique set of challenges. Um, but with animation, you get to start at the beginning of the movie, like literally at the very, very, very beginning. And you live with the movie um, through the whole process. And I find editing animation to be an additive process, whereas editing live action is a deductive process. And by what I mean by that is, with animation, you're building it one element at a time, one shot at a time, and working it methodically that way, whereas in live action, you get a, basically a truck dumps a bunch of footage at you, and 
you have to deduce it down into what it is. And I just find animating, uh, editing animation far more rewarding. Also at the performance level, um, we can edit each word of a performance, work on every micro beat of every breath in there where you can't really do that with a live action performance. So you're really working with the director every day, tailoring every performance down to every frame. So when I came on the project, um, I was given a treatment, basically an overview of the story of what kind of the direction they wanted to go, and then we worked through it together, Mike and I, to kind of build what the arcs was going to be for the character, what the beats were going to be. I remember um, bringing the Robo Jess element to it. That's what I remember coming in and being like, no one's going to buy that robotic Pat if he has, <laughs> doesn't have a cat. They're not going not to think it's really Pat. So, um, so then I wrote the script, and then we worked on it several drafts, punching it up and seeing what was playing um, when we had a read-through and seeing what lines were good and which needed some tweaking. So that's kind of what my part of the process was. I wasn't there as long as these guys, though. So let me segue over to you. Writing is such a better job. <laughs> um, the premise that we were given, and we had, there was a full script when we started, was um, very much the structure you've seen now, which is that um, Pat, for different reasons in the original script, wants to go on to this um, a talent show. And in the original script, the talent show was kind of the star of the movie. And we also have a very limited budget, like you do with these kind of independent films. You know, less than a tenth of what you might have for another animated film. So the script had to be restructured for two reasons. One, to focus on the charm of Pat and his family and to you know, make that relationship work which is something we spent a lot of time working on. And the other thing was to scale the scope of the film down to something that we could produce beautifully and execute you know, as some, in a way we could be proud of with the um, resources we had, which means you have a very limited number of characters, a limited number of sets. It's just like low budget live action, you know, a certain number of lighting setups. So what we had to do was restructure the film to the budget. And this happens on every single you know, non-studio animated film ever. <laughs> you know, so what you do is you have to do a rewrite to take it into scope. And we did that very much. And, and Nicole and everybody and Rob and everybody involved in it was spectacular. And then the script got structurally good. And then we did a table read with the actors, which was something you don't do in big budget animated films. In big budget animated films, they hire actors who never see each other. And you've done this, you've done this for DreamWorks. No, um, it was Ardman or DreamWorks at the time. Both. Both. Yeah. And DreamWorks always. Slushed away, you're talking yeah. about. Yes? Yes. And it's a different process, and you talk about it, where they just, you never meet anybody, and you walk into a little compartment, and they hand you your lines and sides, and you know you just kind of sit in a little box, and you, you're all alone saying lines. Whereas in this, because it's a, it was more, you know, again, it was budgetary issues, and we really wanted the spark and the, and the the team of the actors working together, and we wanted them to be a part, and we wanted them to bring their own humor to it. We um, did table reads, and we actually did a radio play together, and we tried to get the actors to work together as much as possible. And what Nicole and I did was, we, every time anyone ad-libbed or was funny at all, we were furiously writing down what they said, and then we restructured the um, script afterwards to the actors. And so that was the big thing. The only other thing was is that um, we didn't have a villain in the original script. And so we created the role of Carbuncle for Peter. And I mean that literally. It's the second time I've created a <laughs> role in a movie specifically for Peter because he's brilliant. And so once we'd done that, it was just a matter of getting the actors in and, and letting them you know, take our ideas and turn it into brilliance. So, so was the reality show already there and Simon Cowbell? Yeah, Hope? well, his name wasn't Simon Cowbell. I don't think he had a name in the script. No, he, he was Simon from the beginning. He was Simon from the beginning. Yeah, so he was there. He had a Originally much Originally, he was going to do, we were, well, actually, we were trying. It didn't work for him to do the voiceover. I was going and, to ask you that. And, yeah. Did, did you get anywhere at all? And I went, we decided against it. He liked the idea. He said he's not a voiceover actor, of course. And uh, again, as Mike was saying, the budget would have been. Would yes, have I'm shot sure him. he would have asked for a lot of money. <laughs> Uh, you're obviously very faithful to Postman Pat, although it's a much more modern age. I mean, Postman Pat first aired in the United Kingdom on television in 1981, with the second series in 1986, and was then revived in 2004. 
But I understand you work very hard to stay loyal to him, and you actually had the original figures that, that you work from. I mean, can you talk a little bit, bit about rebranding a beloved character, um, you know, for a market that, that knows him and for a market here that obviously doesn't know him? Okay, you guys are going to love this. this. This will be so interesting. Let's talk about branding. Okay, kids. Um, this, this is the reality. This is a charming, wonderful puppet show. And there was no attempt from our part that I'd ever, you know, no one ever, you talked about this, we didn't want to do a poor imitation of the charming, lovely TV series. We wanted to create something different that would stand alone. And so if you wanted to continue doing the puppet show afterwards, you know, we weren't, you know, going to, you know, we weren't going to step in that world. But we also had some technical things we had to deal with, one of which is we were, it was decided it's going to be a CG movie because there's only so much scope you can get out of a tabletop, you know. And um, we had to redesign the characters to work with 3D rigs and 3D lighting and 3D skin. And, you know, also it's been on a very small TV for a lot of years. And now you're going to have this giant face on this huge movie screen, and much nose. bigger than, and that <laughs> nose. And it was in 3D. <laughs> So you know, you know, you'd be ducking out of the way if we left you know him the way he was originally. So we we rebranded it, we um, redesigned him so he could be animated in CG, but we tried very hard to keep to the actual look of Pat. And we were very very happy you know, as we took it around to kids as we were testing it. When nobody said, "Oh look, it's a CG," you know, they said, "Oh, that's Pat," and that's when we knew we had it. And we did that with everybody, and that allowed us to you know travel different places and do things with lighting and stuff that we could not have done with the puppet. But the actual process of getting everybody to sign off on that, you know, took a lot of time and a lot of care. And the creators of the show and the owners of the show were absolutely involved in every step of it. I mean, to the point where we were arguing about Argyle patterns at a certain point, you know. <laughs> so, you know, they, the, the people who own the show and love the show very much had, you know, a lot to say about how it ended up looking. And then we made, you know, technical adjustments for something that had to be animated on a big screen in 3D. And was there ever any suggestion about toning down the Britishness? I mean, there are a lot of terms that Americans well, will not no, understand. Nobody oh, like, my giddy aunt. Yeah, nobody likes Britishness. I mean, the whole world just <laughs> Yes, it doesn't play well in America. <laughs> not, not, a, not a laugh from the, those guys at all. Um, no, it, it was quite the opposite. One thing I was really, really hesitant about when I got talked into taking the, the, the directing reins on this was I was very, very concerned that we were going to just, you know, stick Hollywood all over it, which we didn't want to do. And so that was one of the reasons the movie turned into what it did. We, we, we decided, you know, since we are going to do the Hollywood version of this, mo of this charming English thing, and we want to leave it English, it might be funny if the concept was is that he's getting pulled farther and farther away from his English roots. So if you think of the, the TV show as America, you know, you know, evilly influencing this sweet British guy to come to Hollywood and, you know, lose his soul, you might, you know, it, it kind of works well because we were able to do everybody's worst nightmare. Like, they're going to turn, you know, Postman Pat into a killer android. I'm like, yeah, let's do that. But let, let's do that in a respectful, charming way. So, so a lot of the humor of the movie came from us being not wanting to touch the original characters. And then the other thing, and this isn't British per se, um, unless you look at the divorce rates in America, is the relationship between Pat and Sarah is such a core value of the show that we really, really, really didn't want, you know, we have to do this dramatic movie, but we didn't want ever to veer too far away from the lovely family atmosphere of what Pat is and stuff. So, you know, first and foremost, family movie. Second, a British movie. It's a British movie. It's an import. It just had a couple of Americans working on it. and No one listened to us anyways. Mm -hmm. But, but also a film that works so well for adults and children, which I presume was your intention in writing the script, Nicole. I, I think it's such a, a fine line and very difficult to achieve so well. And I think the adults here would agree that they greatly enjoyed it. I'm so glad that it's playing for you guys. And I think a lot of that goes over here credit-wise because um, the, the faster Jess bot kill kill bit, that's awesome. <laughs> that was, yes, that was a slightly obscure reference that was everyone added. might have caught. It, it's, it's filled with obscure references, but you know, Rob will tell you this, you work on this thing for four years, three years, you get bored, you just put stuff in. Yeah. 
<laughs> you know, it's, just, it's, it's very true. It's <laughs> Where we, we really, I mean. Thanks for saying that. <laughs> <laughs> and then you take it out. <laughs> then, you, then they make you take it out. Yeah. We can't afford that. Yes. The, yes. No, the, um, the, the thing about film, any kind of animated film that I work on, and this is my 25th animated film or something like that, is um, you have to be aware of the fact that it is for the whole family. A kid's movie is a television show. Nobody goes to a theater to watch a kid's movie. You sit at home, you, 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 you turn it on Netflix and you let the kids sit it, and then you go into the kitchen and watch Breaking Bad, right? The, um, a movie which it requires you to get in your car and drive all the kids to the movie theater and park and buy the popcorn and sit them in the seats and run to the bathroom has to be a family event. So we were constantly aware of the fact that we're asking a whole family to come see this. We want something there for everybody, including dad. And you know, everybody has to have a good time because we're asking a lot for you to come. And you know, we got a lot of nice, people said nice things about it. And we're very happy. Yeah. Right, let's turn to the voice talent, the heart of this movie. Um, so Peter, you are something of a classic British villain. Uh, can you talk about? Oh, yes. You're such a great bad guy. And I so see you in the animation, which I'm not sure is a coincidence. But, but can you talk about how much fun you had with this role? Yes. Um, the first, actually, the, the ta on the table read, I had um, particularly bad allergies that day. And, um, you know, whatever your problems are at the time you use them. So I, I had to sort of decide, well, is this going to be a very evil, deep-voiced baddie, lots of breath? Or is it going to be a slightly adenoidal baddie? So I thought somewhere up there, you'd, I'd use the allergies, and I was all blocked up. So that, that's why I, I chose that particular voice. And, um, and it, it, it seems to work. Um, the, uh, I, I think what's important about a baddie is the baddie has to be different from every other character um, you know, in, in the show. It has to be uh, so that kids especially can immediately recognize, OK, I know who that guy is. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I, I enjoyed that. Um, I particularly enjoyed the, um, some of the writing was, was it, for, for any other character, some of that writing would have been excessive. But when you actually do want to conquer the world, you know, it's, I mean, it's wonderful um, to get that opportunity. Because, of course, you never do in, in actual movies. You never do in theatre these days. You know, everyone wants you to whisper in theatre these days. But, um, you know, so that the opportunity to be a, a, a genuine um, uh, baddie was, uh, was one that I enjoyed very much, yeah. And you two are mother and son, yeah. <laughs> oddly enough. <laughs> Uh, you know, can you talk about your experience? And did you all get to record together? It's so unusual that you, that you ever do that on an animated movie. You obviously, you know, Mike mentioned you had a table reading. Yeah, we, we, um, we did. Try that one. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, we did, um, which was so rare and wonderful. Um, so the first time we all met was at this table read, and uh, I really appreciated that because um, we just had a chance to know sort of what we were all doing, where the heart was, and it, it was all there in the script, but it just, it allowed you to have such freedom and be able to play with it, because we knew where everyone was going with it. It was just one of those rare times that you could actually get together, and it never happens in animation, really. And uh, yeah, it was really, really, really helpful. And don't you think it shows in the Yes, film? we were just talking about how, you know, it just, when we did the radio play sort of version especially, um, it was great, it was great. And it really does come across as like we're all in the same place. And, and even feeding off of each other. So, you know, if, uh, if Peter were to, you know, express himself in such a way and it would just affect everybody else and looking at everyone's reactions. So that radio thing that Mike had this great idea for us to all come into the, the studio and record was really helpful, I mm. think. very, very helpful. And what about the particular challenges for you in playing a young boy? A young boy. Um, I actually was over the moon when I heard about um, th that I got the part because um, it wasn't long before that I had um, I had cut a demo reel working on children's characters, and it was something that you know I wanted to to tr sort of try and experiment because you know you when you when you're in the business for so long you sort of want to explore different avenues. And uh, I had created a character very similar to Julian. Um, and then not long after that, this sort of came along. So it was sort of timely and coincidental. Um, I embraced it. I was very, very excited to, um, to get to, yeah, explore it more. 
obviously some of the rest of the voice talent couldn't be here today. Our Stephen Mangan from Episodes is Postman Pat. I don't know if you recognize his voice or Episodes fans. Um, Jim Broadbent is the CEO. David Tennant is Wilf. And Rupert Grint from Harry Potter is, of course, Josh. And I just wondered if, if you guys might talk about what they also brought to the process. I think um, Stephen was brilliant as Postman Pat. I think that he, um, he managed to bring, you know, so the kids actually recognised him and recognised the voice. He didn't want to stray too far from Postman Pat that everyone knows from the TV show, but, um, which I think he successfully did. Um, but, and also maintained that. The wonderful thing about Pat was he's such a sweet, lovely guy with such a big heart which I think he really really brought with it as well and um and his natural humor I think he was a fantastic choice for to play Postman Pat and what about Rupert and David yeah they're all great yeah <laughs> <laughs> I understand that R Rupert actually did his own singing I know and I was, was amazed quite by his, proud of his, it his, um yeah his singing talent who knew yes yeah but Stephen Ro Ronan Keating the Irish pop legend incidentally is the singing voice of uh, Postman Pat don't know if that means Stephen's singing wasn't quite up to par but, oh no um, Stephen wouldn't no <laughs> <laughs> he would have, would have none of it there was a condition Stephen was like I'm not singing <laughs> and I'm like, you know, it's fine. But, you know, it, it, it worked out great because, um, as you know, Rowan actually does the X Factor in Australia. Yes, I saw that, yes. So he works for Simon. <laughs> so there's that whole scene in the beginning where that guy's auditioning, and it's actually Rowan, the guy who, who does the singing voice of Pat. That little character comes in, and Simon just, you know, takes the piss out of him. That's, that's actually Rowan. We built a model for him. And, um, you know, we, that whole thing was just to make fun of his boss. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and, and Rowan was great about it. We, we, we ad-libbed our way through that on the phone, me and him through uh, uh, Australia. And so he, he took the, he loved it, and he wanted to do the songs, and he was so gracious about it, and he was so kind. I called him up and begged him to do it. Like, I called many of the cast and begged them to do it. But um, Rowan's only condition was like, you know, let's, let's get Simon. You know, Simon won't do the part, yeah, let's yeah, get yeah. him. So, you know, he was fantastic and a huge supporter of it. Now, you are actually a man of many talents because you are also Jess the Cat. Can you talk about being Jess? <laughs> um, I, would, I wish I could say something clever, but because it's being recorded and real, I'll, I'll tell you the actual reality of animated films. Um, oh, sure. Um, so the, um, to just be serious about it, you know, other than the fact that I've always wanted to play a cat my whole life, you know, really, I'm, I'm done with show business now, I've, I've achieved that. <laughs> no, um, you're, you go through and you, you, things like meowing and banging and screaming and yelling in the editorial bay, you're constantly cutting storyboards in and to get them to play you have to do this scratch. So what we had was this brilliant radio play, which is different than a, than a table read. A table read, we all come together and we're very relaxed and we're goofing around, we're finding the characters. And then a radio play is like an old-fashioned live radio broadcast where everybody stands in front of a microphone and goes. And a lot of what you heard was that original, I don't know if you guys know that, but 80% of that was done at the radio play. And so you hear the little mms and ahs and, you know, Peter's ad lib of like, you know, I wish I had a cat. You know, it was just Peter <laughs> spinning around. That got a big laugh. <laughs> and, um, and, and so we had that, but what we didn't have was enough meows. And you can't afford to bring an actor in every time you realize you need another meow. So I just started doing the meows. And at the end, there was something like 1,400 meows. And we're like, no. it's just easier to leave Mike in there. We'll pitch it up. He used to call me late at night and say, look, I'm already worried about this role. You know, how do I get the cat to, to do this? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm just... Because he's a director, OK? You know, so he, does, he has this problem with, with playing anything, especially a cat. The cat needs he, more lines. Yes. <laughs> he managed in the end. I mean, obviously, um, you know, star names who do animated movies um, often end up looking rather like their characters. And I think you're the only one, really, Peter, who looks a little bit like your character. Is, was that intentional? He had a little bit more hair than I did. <laughs> he did. <laughs> a little bit more. I, I don't know. I mean, it, but you, you sort of created that, didn't you? I mean, um, uh, there wasn't any sort of uh, uh, visual image for Carbuncle when I came to the table read, as I remember. So, yeah, no. maybe I inspired it. No, you did. I mean, you know, I, I wasn't kidding when I said this, and Nicole can talk about this, too. 
we created Carbuncle out of whole cloth specifically for Peter. I mean, it was that role was written exactly for Peter. And when we figured out we needed a villain and we needed a you know a antagonist to move the plot along because you can't have you know Pat suddenly decide to give up being a mailman and run off to Hollywood. That's not a good movie. Um, we you know everything about that particular part, and it was you know it's the only original you know part here was specifically. And so like because I saw Peter in my head when I was you know talking to you about writing it, I saw Peter in my head when I was drawing it, and it's Peter. But those of you who, who are actors here will, will know how unusual it is for any kind of um, voiceover work to be done around a table and for most of that to be actually used. I mean, that was what was so extraordinary that we actually came together and gave a performance of the script. Um, and as Mike said, 80% of it was used. Of course, we, we all came in later and did other you know little bits and chunks and, and rewrites. But um, that was what was so, so interesting and, and unusual was that we all got to sit around and work with each other, you know, and, and that's so different from, you know, walking into a booth with a script and you don't know who you're working with and you just say the lines and then the director says, okay, try it this way. And you think, well, why, you know, because only, of course, he has the idea in his head. Just it's do it. Gonna, just do it, yeah. <laughs> yes. um, so, I mean, that was a great way to work. I enjoyed that very much. Thank you. I was just wondering, are there any questions from the audience? I'm really glad we got that cat thing cleared up. <laughs> She, she's asking about the, the Dalek uh, coming in, if any of you I, I'm didn't sorry, hear that. For legal reasons, that wasn't a Dalek. No. <laughs> that, that's exactly what I was going to ask. How on earth can you have a Dalek in there? Well, it said not a Dalek in the script, right? right yeah, right. so it says not a Dalek, not a Dalek when you read the line. <laughs> did you recognize the voice of who did that? Yeah. The Dalek. If you th okay. th 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 here's something Dalek. for you guys. Nice. Th that's actually a very famous actor's voice. Who, in, when we he heard we were doing this, he he called and asked if he could come in and do just a little part. No. And he's he's a very famous late night host who loves Daleks. And I'll just leave that uh, that hint Scottish. out there for you. He's uh, he's a bit Scottish. Anyone? A bit Scottish. That's Craig Ferguson. Yeah, yeah. Craig Craig came in to do the Dalek. <laughs> it, 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 over me. Yes, yes, the Foley. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, yeah, the full look. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? In the um, credits, they had words that, as an American, I don't know what they are. Walla was one, and Reindeer Wrangler. Render. Render Wrangler. Okay, sure, I can explain those. Um, Walla is the most prolific actor in voice acting today. He's in almost every film. Um, wow. And nobody likes working with him. He said, no. Walla is actually a, <laughs> nobody here has done it. So that, that just bombed like what are many, many, many of my jokes. No, the um, Walla is actually um, shorthand for the noises you hear in the background, people just muttering and stuff. Let's we'll show you. Believe, believe it or not. And, and, and because groups of people do that together, you can't credit each individual one because you go through and you can't tell who's what. So it's, it's, it's called Walla. And that's a standard in almost any film, live action or animation. And the other one was Render Wrangler. Um, there were cowboys. Just <laughs> cowboys would suddenly attack the studio and we gave them names. No, um, when you actually make an, an, a 3D film, there is this giant bank of computers off in the corner, you know, the size of a warehouse. And um, it's what renders out, it's what, it's what gives you the final frame. It takes it from that wire frame you've seen in commercials and stuff, and it puts all the skin and color and lighting on it. And that process is called rendering, and it breaks a lot. It always breaks at 2 in the morning, and it's always when you're on a deadline, and you always have to go back and redo it. And so you hire someone to sit there and stare at the computers all night. <laughs> That's his job. And if the little bl blinking green light goes to yellow, he jumps up and re-renders the frame, and he's called a render wrangler. And it's the most important job on the film. <laughs> most important, least paid job. Yes, it is. I just wanted to mention, I don't think you'd be very surprised to hear that the film was a massive hit in the UK. It opened in cinemas in, I believe, May of this year? Yes. 
and we're still in cinemas until a couple of weeks ago, which is absolutely e extraordinary. It's available on DVD here. And, and just before we go, um, we've got a little giveaway. Would you like to reach under your seats and see if you find anything attached underneath? <laughs> oh, wait, look, way, way back on your seat underneath. Not, not people's purses, but a piece of paper stuck to the bottom of the seat. Is that correct, Marlene? Piece of paper stuck to the bottom of the seat. Hey, that gum is mine. <laughs> <laughs> ah! <laughs> uh. Not that says do not remove from seat. Do we have any winners? Ah, would you like to come up and receive your prize? While we're doing that, I'd just like to thank everybody for being here. By the way, my name's Leslie O'Toole. I'm a British entertainment journalist. I write for British newspapers and magazines, and I'm a contributor to Backstage. I hope you all have very happy holidays, and thank you all very much for being thank here. Thank you. It was thank so you. much fun. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs>